Now, I think this goes some way in understanding why, in explaining why some cities are doing so much better than others. But not all the way. I mean, why do we see that you know, the San Francisco's and the Seattle's keep doing better and better? What stops convergence across cities? Why are employers not taking advantage of the cheap labor that exists in Visalia? We're talking about two hours drive. I mean, they could, why are, are, are they not locating all these great jobs two hours away? Well, this is where the agglomeration economies that, that, that Tito was referring to comes into play. Um, you can call it agglomeration economies of clustering, but what's clear is that cities that attract a lot of college-educated workers and a lot of innovative employers tend to attract even more of them. So when Twitter opens in San Francisco, it makes the San Francisco labor market even more desirable for future entrepreneurs in that area. And when software engineers move and get jobs at Twitter, they make the local labor market even more appealing for future software engineers who find that labor market uh, uh, even more attractive. It's, it's a tipping point dynamic, uh, or, or you know, another way to put it, it's a self-reinforcing trend that tends to magnify the difference between the cities with a lot of human capital and a lot of innovation in cities with limited human capital and limited innovation. So wh what drives this clustering? Um, well, there's a growing body of uh, academic evidence that points to the, role, the important role of human capital externalities as a very important form of uh, a clustering factor. Um, there is the advantage of having thick labor markets where labor demand and labor supply can meet in more efficient ways, and where the match between workers and firms tend to be more efficient. It's a better match for, especially when you have idiosyncratic skills, very, very, very different type of skills. So if you are a biotech engineer um, and with very specialized skills, working in a thick labor market will allow you to find a better match for your skills than working in a thin labor market. And there's also the role of intermediate services, uh, which includes everything from venture capitalists that understand your industry and your firm to specialized labor uh, uh, lab technicians uh, that, that understand how to use the machine that, that you need. But rather than giving you all the literature review of, uh, on this, let me tell you a story of, 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 that I think illustrates the power of, agglomerate, of agglomeration economies and how they can reshape the destiny of, of cities. The story is, is the story of two cities, um, Seattle and Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the year is about 1980. Today we have a great, we have a view of Seattle as one of the, at least, you know, if you are in the U.S., Seattle is one of the most attractive, fun, interesting, successful cities that are around. There's a lot of cultural amenities, there is a lot, there is a great labor market. Um, it's as if, I mean, if you go to Seattle, it's as if the recession never really took place. They, 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 be, they kept growing uh, uh, through the recession. But Seattle wasn't like this. Uh, if you look at Seattle in the late 70s, it was a very different economy and a very different city. Seattle in the 1970s, especially the late 70s, um, was a city with a very poor industry mix. It was an industry mix heavily weighted on traditional manufacturing. Um, they had car manufacturing, they had lumber. Uh, they had very little innovation with the exception of Boeing. But Boeing in the 70s and the early 80s was struggling, was shedding jobs by the thousands. Interest rates were high, people were not buying planes, and Boeing was, was really uh, 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 um, laying off thousands of people. Um, and then, in 1979, something happened uh, that changed the history of the city forever. And it, it, what happened was that there was a small company uh, that was located in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that decided to relocate to Seattle. The company was headed by a guy named uh, Bill Gates, and it was named Microsoft. And at the time, it had seven employees. So when Microsoft moved from Albuquerque to Seattle, nobody even noticed. There was no, there's no trace on the newspaper that Microsoft had moved. 
It was just a small company. Why did Bill Gates move to Seattle? It was certainly not for business reasons. It was not for economic reasons. Um, the city was a mess at the time. Um, it was mostly because his family is there. He grew up there. And he wanted to be close to where he grew up. So it was a purely a personal reason. But that was the seed uh, for the growth of Seattle. If you look at the data on wages, employment, college share, and pretty much any other indicator of a healthy labor market, what you see is that in the 20 years before Bill Gates moved, Seattle and Albuquerque track each other very closely. The trend is, is almost identical. Then after Microsoft moves, you see Albuquerque keeps struggling, keeps going pretty much at the same trend. But Seattle keeps growing much faster than anything you've seen uh, before, and much faster than the rest of the US. It looks like one of the graphs that I was showing you before, with the great divergence. Now, how did Microsoft do it? Because, sure, Microsoft is a big company. We're talking about 40,000 people today. But Seattle is a big metro area. We're talking about 2 million people. So it wasn't just that Microsoft employed a lot of people there, because that would, make, would improve the situation in, in Seattle, but wasn't really the reason. It was the fact that Microsoft, as it grew and became more and more successful, became the, the seed for the cluster. It became the, the attractive power that attracted all a lot of software companies there, a lot of internet companies there, a lot of high tech companies there, and more recently, a lot of biotech companies there. Um, so it wasn't the direct effect of Microsoft, it was the agglomeration economies, the clustering effect that Microsoft caused there. And this is clearest uh, in another story. I mean, if, if you look at, uh, it's, uh, the year is now 1995, and there's another young entrepreneur with big dreams trying to decide where to go. His name is Jess Bezos, and he has a plan for an internet store that sells stuff online. And he wants to call it Amazon. It's 1995 now. Jeff Bezos is at just the beginning of the internet era. He has no reason, no personal reason to be in Seattle. He lives in Manhattan. He's not from Seattle. In fact, he's from Albuquerque, New Mexico. But he decides to put his startup, again, at the time with three employees, in Seattle. Why? Well, by 1995, he had to be in Seattle. He had no personal reason to be there. By 1995, if you had, to do, if you had this internet startup and you wanted to find the, the best workers who knew how to set up a, a website, the venture capitalists who understood the industry, and the, the, the best talent, you had to be there. I mean, there were two or three places, like Silicon Valley, Seattle, and maybe uh, a couple of other places in the globe. Where, where... So by 1995, the attractive power generated by Microsoft is so strong that even if you had no personal reason to be there, you needed to be there, or, or at least there were strong economic reasons to be there. And I think that this story represents one of the reasons why we see the great divergence, one of the reasons why we see the growth that is becoming stronger and stronger in some cities and weaker and weaker in other cities. Uh, the, you look at the city of Seattle today, and it's a universe away from Albuquerque. If Albuquerque had kept Microsoft, chances are that we would be talking about how cool is Albuquerque, how fun it is, and what a great labor market it is. But Albuquerque lost. Uh, Microsoft, and, and now we're talking about how great of a city Seattle is. Now, this is all great if you are a software engineer or computer scientist. It's great news. But what if you are not a software engineer or computer scientist? What if you're just an average worker? And the reason why this question is important is that you know, we cannot all work for Microsoft, for Google, or for Apple, or for the latest biotech startup. In fact, most of us will never work for those companies. In fact, if you look at the, the data for the US labor force, the vast majority of people are employed in local services, and only a minority of people are employed in innovation. Even in a place like Seattle, or even in a place like Silicon Valley, this number is around like 20%. You never, it's not like we can 
th that innovation will ever employ the majority of workers. And the reason is very simple. About two-thirds of workers in pretty much any developed economy, in any Western economy, is employed in local services. And th th this is a number that is fairly constant. Uh, and what are local services? And when I define local services, I define it from the point of view of a city. So it's, for economists in the room, is the non-traded sector, but defined at the local level, at the city level. What are local services? Well, they include a vast and diverse group of occupations that include the, the waiter in a restaurant, the, the store clerk in a store, the, uh, the taxi driver, the carpenter that build a house, but also very professional occupations like doctors and lawyers and architects. What they all have in common is that they are selling an untraded good. So they're selling a good that is both produced and consumed in a city. And why, the reason why this is important is that they represent, it's true that they represent the majority of jobs in each city, but they're never the cause of economic growth. They're always the effect of economic growth. And the reason is that demand for local services crucially depends on the wealth that exists in the community. And so job growth in the traded sector, in the, for, in the, in the, in the export sector, you might want to call it, calls, uh, cause job growth in local services. Even with a small share, of, of jobs, the trade sector is the driver of productivity growth and job growth in the rest of the local labor market. So for example, if Google adds a software engineer in downtown San Francisco, there's going to be more jobs for waiters, taxi drivers, doctors, and architects in downtown San Francisco. But it doesn't go the other way around. If we add a taxi driver in San Francisco, we're not going to have more jobs at Google. And so this point, the point is that with a third of the employment, the trade sector, it, it's essentially supporting the two-third, it's essentially creating the demand that employs the two-third of the labor force that works in, in the local service. Now, this effect, I call it the multiplier effect, and is particularly strong for high tech and innovation. My estimates suggest that for each innovation job in a metropolitan area, five additional jobs are ultimately created in the long run in the same area uh, outside innovation. Uh, two in professional jobs, so the doctors, the architects, and so on, and three in unprofessional jobs, the waiters and the carpenters, and so on. So it's a remarkably large multiplier effect. J just to give you a sense of how large it is, you know, think about a, a company like Twitter. All my examples are from San Francisco because that's where I live. But you can pick up any, you know, pick up, you know, Seattle or, or, or Raleigh, Durham, uh, or, or Austin. Change the name of the, of the employer and, and the same math goes through. Twitter today has nine, 900 employees in downtown San Francisco. This amounts to, by my estimates, to indirect job creation of about uh, 4,500 4, additional positions in the community outside ITAC. So remarkably, the most important impact that an ITAC company like Twitter has on the San Francisco labor, labor, local labor market is not in ITAC. It's actually, if you count jobs, it's actually outside ITAC. Now, every sector has a multiplier, but my estimate suggests that uh, manufacturing has, uh, the, the high tech has a larger multiplier than manufacturing. In fact, the, the high tech multiplier is three times larger than the manufacturing multiplier. First of all, because high tech and innovation in general pay high, higher salary and therefore more, more, um, these people are consuming more. They're going more to the restaurant, more architects and more uh, therapists and more childcare specialists and so on. Second, because ITAC firms tend to use more of local services than, than manufacturing firms. So the local multiplier is stronger. And third, because of the clustering effect, is stronger in ITAC. And so if you attract an ITAC job today, then you have more ITAC jobs in the future, and therefore even more indirect job, indirect job, job, job creation. So this leads me to draw a couple of conclusions, um, implications. Not conclusions yet, just give me a five minutes more. 
Um, the first implication is that innovation jobs are and will always be a minority of total employment, even in places like the brain hubs of America. Um, the reason why those places are doing so well is not that it's not just that innovation is growing, so it's not just the direct effect of innovation, but the most important reason is that the growth of innovation employment generates wealth that then supports the demand for the 65% of employment which is employed in the local service sector. And the second implication is that today if you are a local government, say a state or a city, and you are trying to create jobs for the least fortunate of your residents, the high school graduates or the high school dropouts, those, those who will never be able to work for Google or Apple, probably the best way you can do to create jobs for those people is to attract high-tech companies that hire a lot of highly skilled workers that brings good local service jobs. This idea that in order to help blue-collar workers, this idea that in order to help less educated individuals we need to attract more manufacturing is very popular in the American left and also in the European left. The idea of protecting blue-collar jobs I think sounds good but I don't think it's the way to go. I don't think that's where the jobs of the future are for the people who cannot work in, in, in innovation. I think most likely the jobs are going to be in local services. Uh, by the way, wages also reflect that. It's not just jobs because people always say, oh, okay, you, you create a lot of jobs for wages, but that's not you know, a great salary. That's true, but there's a, certainly a positive correlation between the fraction of college-educated workers in a city and the salary of high school graduates in the same city. Okay? Um, and I've done some work that suggests that this correlation is actually a, it's causal, it's not just spurious. So cities like around here with a lot of college graduates, a lot of innovative jobs, in these cities workers with an high school degree uh, are better paid than cities down here with, with few educated workers. Now, what about the rest of the world or the rest of Europe? I think you see, and, and, I, and then I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I, I want to open it up for, for questions. I think you see a similar trend, uh, although not as sharp, sharp in, in the Europe and also in developing countries. If you look at China, for example, you see a clear evidence of divergence. China as a whole has grown tremendously, has grown at a rate of 10% per year for the past 10 years. But places like the Shanghai or, or, or Beijing have grown much faster than Western China. So the gap within China has increased between the, the successful cities, the brain hubs of China, and the, and the more rural, the, the, the more traditional cities in the, in the Western part of the country, has grown probably faster than, than the US. The same thing you see in India. When you compare places like Bangalore or Mumbai, in terms of salaries of, 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 or productivity, you compare it to a state like Bihar, they both have grown, but the growth in Bangalore and, and, and Mumbai is much faster than the growth in, in Bihar. And so again, you see a divergence. And closer to home, I, I also think that, that this is, you're also seeing some of the same trends here. There are some places in Europe that are magnet for high-skill labor. London is obviously the obvious example. We've all been there, we all see how stunning the growth of London is. The, the new census just came out. Between 2001 and 2011, London added a million new residents, which is unprecedented for a, a, European, for a European city. There are some of the brightest and best educated Italians, Spaniards, French, Germans are, are going there. Um, and again, I think this, this success is feeding on itself. Uh, and, it's, it's, and it used to be just finance, but I think it's, London now has a very well diversified uh, set of industries, uh, including uh, a lot of software, a lot of digital entertainment, uh, a lot of internet jobs, um, different parts of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of the science and technology. Sure. Real estate is very expensive, so you don't have labs, a lot of labs there, but, uh, but you definitely have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of IT. 
Stockholm is also a good example. If you go to Stockholm, the, share that Sto the share of GDP that Stockholm is creating in, in Sweden is increasing over time and has been increasing for, for 10 years. Amsterdam, Munich are other examples. So where is Italy in this landscape? Well, unfortunately, it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, in, the, in the first group of cities. Uh, Italian cities are not... The Italian cities are characterized by few innovation clusters. They're mostly limited in scope, limited in size. None of them has a European or, or, a, global, or a global weight. And so I think there are serious reasons to be concerned about the long-run trends for this country. Just like Albuquerque is farther and farther away from Seattle, I think Italy is farther and farther away from the first group of cities in Europe. There's a number of reasons, uh, cultural, historical, and economical, um, and we can talk about it in a discussion. Uh, one reason is that Italian firms tend to be very small, and investment in innovation is a fixed cost. And so if you have small firms, they're going to be unlikely to, to, have, uh, to invest in, in, in large fixed costs. So if you think about investing... If you think about the cost of creating the new window system, you know, it cost probably $5 billion to create the first unit of, of, of windows and one cent to create the second one. Okay, so it's a huge fixed cost. And then if you sell a lot of, a lot of copies uh, uh, or if you sell few copies, that, that, that most of the cost is fixed. The same thing is true in pharmaceutical and biotech research. It's all fixed cost. So if you have small companies, they're not going to invest in, fi in large fixed cost. That's, they don't have the size. It doesn't make sense. Italian companies tend to, there's a lot of studies that shows that the labor market for small companies in, the U, in, in Italy is very flexible. Um, that they, but as they, keep, as they grow, the labor market becomes, the enforcement becomes, <laughs> turns the, 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 the labor market much less flexible. Uh, fiscal pressure becomes much higher, and therefore Italian companies are discouraged from, from growing. It was a great model to have small companies in the 50s and the 60s. I don't think it's a sustainable model in a world where job growth is in this type of industries that require humongous fixed costs. There's limited investment in human capital in Italy. We all know about the trouble of Italian schools. There's also very limited attractiveness of high-skilled immigrants from Europe. Uh, and this, I think, is a, there's, no reason, there's no reason why we shouldn't be at an attractive place. But we're, for, for highly skilled, highly educated, ambitious uh, uh, immigrants from the rest of Europe. Um, we have a very under, underdeveloped venture capital system. It's really hard if you grow up poor or you don't have a lot of collateral to go to, uh, uh, to somebody in Italy and say, hey, I have a great startup idea. Give me a million euros to start. And then there is a structural inability to respect and enforce the rules of law at pretty much any level. And so it's pretty much very, very unlikely that without a very decis decisive change in this that we're going to be attractive for outside investment. Um, and unfortunately, the trends in all of these elements are, are not in the, right, in the right direction. So I want to I wanna conclude because I want to open it up for discussion. I think the last 30 years have been years of profound structural change of the labor market in all Western economies. Uh, this is not the first time that these changes are occurring. We've seen a similar change early in the 20th centuries when all Western economies moved from a labor force that was mostly agricultural to a labor force that became mostly money, that, that had a large number of manufacturing jobs. Uh, and it was, the dynamic was very similar. Technological progress made tractors and fertilizers available. And so the labor force, in, if you look at 1900, almost half of the American workers were laboring in a field, were working in agriculture. In, by 1930, less than half of them were still in agriculture. So, so very similar to the trend that we're seeing today. Um, by today, only 1% of workers in, 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 in the U.S. are working in agriculture. Manufacturing was, for 
most of the 20th century is the engine that lifted all these countries from, from low income to being middle and then later high income. But I don't think it has that propulsive force anymore. And I think we're seeing the same secular structural shift away from manufacturing into new industries. Um, the, the causes, the underlying drivers are the same for all Western economies. But different Western countries differ on what's substituting these lost manufacturing jobs. I think that the, the, the places like the brain hubs in the US or in Europe or in China and India are benefiting from these structural changes. Uh, places like San Francisco uh, or, or London are clearly benefiting from globalization and automation and technical change. Other places like Detroit or Cleveland and a lot of Italian cities are being hard because labor demand is much lower thanks to globalization and uh, structural change. So, so the same forces have profoundly different effects on different cities. The gap between those who are benefiting and those who are being hurt, I think, is increasing. Certainly in the US, certainly in, in a lot of developing countries, and I think increasingly, in, in, although to much less extent in, in Europe, but it's, it's beginning, and I think it's, it's going in that direction. In my view, I, I suspect that the economics of clustering, the attractive power of clusters, suggests that this gap will not close anytime soon. In fact, it will probably keep growing, possibly even at an accelerating rate in the coming two or three decades. And that, unfortunately, Italy in this landscape is not in a great position. And I think that unless something deep and structural changes, Italy will look more and more like the Albuquerque of the world, and less and less like the Seattle of the world. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>